On tonight's summary of the Israel-Hamas War, Day 281. The IDF launches massive airstrike attempting to assassinate number two in Hamas and the leader of the Al-Qassam Brigades, Muhammad Def. The success of the assassination attempt is still unknown. Series of assassinations throughout the Gaza Strip. The IDF targets a deputy commander of Hamas's Sajaiya Battalion, Hamas's head of security operations, and intelligence field commanders. The International Court of Justice announces that it will deliver its advisory opinion with regards to the Israeli occupation in the West Bank already next week. Combined missile and drone attacks by Hezbollah leave one Israeli killed and four badly injured. The IDF retaliates throughout Lebanon. The Washington Post reports that Israel and Hamas have agreed on an interim government for Gaza that will take place during the second phase of the hostage deal. The report is later denied by both sides. Hello everyone, I am Alon Burstein, Visiting Assistant Professor in the Department of Political Science and Israel Institute Fellow at the University of California, Irvine, here bringing you the latest highlights from the Israel-Hamas War. It is currently the evening of July 13, 2024 in the United States, the morning of July 14, 2024 in the Middle East. Starting with the biggest news coming out from the last 24 hours, on Saturday morning, July 13th, the IDF attempted to assassinate Mohammed Def. Muhammad Def is the leader of the Izzadin al-Qassam brigades in the Gaza Strip, and arguably the most important military figure within Hamas. He's also listed as number two in Hamas's ranks within the Gaza Strip. The assassination involved a multi-level attack against a compound in the outskirts between the Al-Muasi refugee camp and Hanunis, and included two initial airstrikes against the compound where Def was believed to be, according to intelligence, followed by firebelt bombings around the area in order to reportedly stop any rescue attempts, after which there were bunker-penetrating bombs that were dropped in the area in order to destroy any underground facilities that Def may have been in. The IDF stated that alongside Def was Hamas's Han Yunus division commander, Rafa Salame, also one of the main figures within Hamas's Izzadin al Qassam brigades, and also one of the architects of the October 7th attack. Thus far, there's been no confirmation about whether Def and Salome were successfully assassinated or not. The IDF has reported cautious optimism when it comes to confirming the death of Salome. However, about Def, there has been there have been initial rumors that he might have been killed. However, these have since been denied, and thus far, there is no confirmation. On the ground in the Gaza Strip, Palestinian sources reported substantial casualties as a result of the attack that occurred again on the outskirts of the al Muasi humanitarian zone and Han Yunis. Some reports indicating at least 90 Palestinians were killed in this attack and over 300 were injured. The IDF stated that within this compound area there were many Hamas operatives that were dressed in civilian clothing and that the Israeli military believes that most of those killed were Hamas operatives. In addition, the Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu stated in a press conference that he did, did not authorize the attack until it was confirmed that there are no hostages that were held as human shields alongside Muhammad Def. Surrounding the assassination attempt, the Saudi Al Hadith News Network reported hours after the bombing that Hamas is currently in the process of investigating the internal security leak that may have led to the discovery of Def's location, specifically that it is interrogating the different people around Def if any of them may be collaborating collaborators with the IDF. Regarding the current aftermath, Khalil al-Haya, who was Yahya Sinwar's deputy within the Gaza Strip, issued a statement denying that Def had been assassinated, stating that Muhammad Def heard Netanyahu's press conference tonight about his assassination and in fact laughed. Meanwhile, the Saudi al-Hadith put out a statement confirming the death of Hamas's Han Yunus division commander, Rafa Salame. However, I will say that that statement came out extremely quickly after the attack, and this has not been confirmed by anyone else, not by Hamas, nor by the IDF, so that while that is the only confirmation that Salame has been killed, and the IDF has stated cautious optimism that Salome has been killed, I will say this is yet to be confirmed. Right now, we do not know if Def has in fact been killed or not, maybe he was badly injured or otherwise. I will also add that in his history, he has survived at least seven assassination attempts of the IDF, not including today's. 
in these different assassination attempts, he has over the years lost the use of his arm, he has possibly lost the use of one eye. It is also reported that in an assassination attempt of 2014, his wife and son were killed also. We'll likely learn more about this in the coming days, however, it's also important to note that Muhammad Def is an extremely shadowy figure. Unlike a lot of the Hamas leadership, he's never in the spotlight, there are very few pictures of him, and it is very possible that Hamas is going to use this to create a mystery around whether he is alive or dead in the, uh, after this assassination, so we will probably learn more about this in the coming days, but whether he was successfully assassinated or not may actually stay a mystery for some time. Moving on to the hostage situation, on July 13th, following the assassination attempt, Reuters quoted the Egyptian sources, stating that the hostage negotiations have been suspended. Israel denied this and stated that it received no such information about any such suspension. Again, we're probably going to learn more about this as it becomes clearer what are the results of that assassination. Prior to this, however, there have been several different important reports regarding the negotiations in the last several days. On July 11th, the head of the Israeli Shabak, Ronen Bar, traveled to Egypt to continue the negotiations, focusing, according to reports, on the main disagreements regarding the Philadelphia Line and the Rafah crossing, and the Philadelphia Line is the border between Gaza and Egypt. That same day, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu gave a speech stating that Israel will remain in control of the Philadelphia Line, regardless of any outcome. High-ranking sources, both Israeli and international, stated that such a demand being raised by Netanyahu is another new condition that the Prime Minister is adding to the deal, suggesting that it will further complicate the negotiations. Relating to this matter, on July 11th, the Lebanese Hezbollah-affiliated newspaper Al-Akhbar reported that major advances were made between Israel and Egypt with regards to an idea of redeployment and reactivating the Rafah crossing. The report added that the crossing's operation will be coordinated between Egypt and Palestinian actors, and there will also be an Israeli presence in the area. However, a day later, on July 12th, the Egyptian Al-Qahara Al-Akhbariya published a report denying those statements adding that negotiations right now between Israel and Egypt are revolving around installing sensor arrays along the Philadelphia line. Reuters also confirmed this that day, adding there is broad agreement between Israel and Egypt about the installation of these sensors that are, according to reports, going to be funded by the United States. Alongside this, the negotiations have also continued in Qatar in the last several days. On July 11th, Israeli officials stated that little progress was made in the high-ranking meeting between all the negotiators. However, that the sides did clarify their points of agreement and disagreement, which can now lay the foundation for another round of negotiations. Again, all this was before that assassination attempt. The Israeli Ynet News Network quoted Israeli sources stating that the biggest source of disagreement in the current stage of negotiations in Qatar revolves around the return of Palestinians to the northern parts of the Gaza Strip. Hamas demands complete freedom of movement, which would require an idea of withdrawal from the Netzarim Corridor and the main roads leading north, while the Israeli Prime Minister has instructed the negotiating team that movement of Palestinians north will only be permitted by passing through IDF checkpoints so as to stop movement of armed Palestinians north, i.e., the Prime Minister is instructing the team to say that Israel and the IDF are going to hold on to the Nitzarim Corridor that divides the Gaza Strip from north to south, and Hamas is saying that is a, a condition for moving forward in the agreement. Right now, there is that report that, that Egypt said that negotiations are suspended. However, Hamas has also issued statements in the last several hours saying negotiations might continue, but this also comes alongside the fact that Hamas is saying that Def was not assassinated. If it turns out that he was, maybe things will change. We will learn more about this in the coming days. Moving on to the Gaza Strip, there were repeated rockets and mortars that were fired from the Gaza Strip towards Israel in the last several days. Rocket targeted the areas of near Israel in the Lachish area, and there were also barrages of rockets that were fired from Rafah targeting the areas of Eshkol, specifically the regions of Yated, Chulit, Sede Avraham, Dekel, of Shalom, Yuval, as well as Kerem Shalom. Regarding the fighting in the Gaza Strip, there were many assassinations that were reported in the past several days in addition to the attempt of, on Muhammad Def and Rafa Salameh. Regarding those assassinations and the ongoing fighting in the Gaza Strip, in the northern parts of the Gaza Strip on July 12th, Ayman Shawida, the deputy commander of Hamas's Saja'iyah Battalion, was reportedly assassinated. A prominent figure within Hamas's operational command headquarters, he is also one of the people who directed the October 7th attack, according to the IDF. He was assassinated along alongside a platoon commander in the Saja'iyah Battalion, known as Abada Abuhin. 
In addition to that, the IDF reported raiding an UNRWA headquarters in the Savara neighborhood in the northern parts of Gaza City. Many Hamas operatives that fled from Sajaia were reportedly held up in this UNRWA headquarters, and intensive gun battles were reported. As seen in some of the pictures that were published, the IDF also reported locating drone equipment, weaponry, lookout posts, rockets, and mortars, all within this UNRWA facility. In other news related to the northern parts of the Gaza Strip, airstrikes were reported in the Beit Hanun area on July 12th, following rockets being launched from there in the previous day. In addition to that, Palestinian medical and rescue forces reported that after the IDF had pulled out of its operation in Tel el the rescue forces have managed to retrieve at least 60 bodies of Palestinians from the streets of Tel el adding that there are other bodies that are also trapped under the rubble. In addition to this, the Al-Qassam Brigades also reported detonating at least two explosive devices near IDF vehicles in the Tel el region, as well as intensive gun battles throughout Gaza City. On July 13th, Nimer Hamida, who's a prominent member of Hamas's West Bank activity, who was released in the Shalit deal of 2011, was also assassinated in the northern parts of the Gaza Strip in the Al-Shati refugee camp. Palestinian sources reported that at least 20 more Palestinians were killed in that attack. In the central parts of the Gaza Strip, on July 11th, Hassan Abu Quaik, who's Hamas's head of security operations for the central camps in the Gaza Strip, was also assassinated. Alongside him, Nasser Mahana, who's a commander in Hamas's intelligence unit, was also killed. It was reported that the assassination took place during the week, not necessarily on July 11th, however, it was only confirmed on July 11th. It was also reported that Abu Quaik was active in Hamas's emergency committees, those are the committees that have been active, active since the war began, trying to reassert Hamas governance in the different parts of the Gaza Strip. In addition to that, on July 12th, the IDF reported intensive activity in the central parts of the Gaza Strip, identifying a weapons manufacturing area that Hamas has rebuilt, and confiscating substantial monies used to fund this activity. In addition to that, on July 13th, Palestinian sources reported major bombings in the Deir el area, including an attack on a house in which five Palestinians were reportedly killed. In the southern parts of the Gaza Strip, in addition to that assassination attempt on Muhammad Def and Rafa Salameh, on July 11th, major airstrikes and artillery fire was reported as the IDF targeted the launching sites from which rockets were fired to the areas surrounding the Gaza Strip. The IDF reported that Hamas operatives firing the rockets were in fact killed. In addition to that, on July 12th, there was ongoing battles that were reported throughout the southern parts of the Gaza Strip. The al Qassam Brigades reported targeting IDF vehicles with RPGs, and other gang battles were reported in the areas of Tel Zurub in the southwestern regions of Rafah. In addition to that, on July 12th, the IDF reported assassinating Hussam Mansour, who's a division commander in Hamas's internal security operations, and he's also one of the people who was in charge of the El Hir organization. This is an organization that is in charge of channeling money from different charity organizations towards Hamas. Again, all that has occurred within the Gaza Strip in the last three days. Regarding casualties, the IDF is reporting that one IDF soldier was killed in the Gaza Strip in the last three days, bringing the total number of IDF soldiers killed in the Gaza Strip since the invasion began to 326. Nine IDF soldiers reported injured in the Gaza Strip in, in the last three days, bringing the total number of IDF soldiers injured in the Gaza Strip since the invasion began to 2,124. The Palestinian Health Ministry in the Gaza Strip is reporting that 148 Palestinians were killed in the Gaza Strip in the last three days. However, it's important to note that those numbers came out prior to that assassination attempt of Muhammad Def, bringing the total number of Palestinians killed in the Gaza Strip since the war began to 38,443. 88,481 Palestinians are reported injured in the Gaza Strip since the war began. I remind everyone that the figures of the Palestinian Health Ministry include both militants and civilians. These are all the Palestinians that are reported killed in the Gaza Strip since the war began. However, again, that is before that major airstrike occurred in the areas between Han Yunus and the El Mwasi refugee camp. Some news from the humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip. On July 11th, the Pentagon reported that the attempts to reconnect the floating pier that the United States has constructed along the shores of Gaza for the final time have failed. The weather conditions did not permit this connection, and the pier is now going to be dismantled. In grand total, it was functional for a period of between 20 and 21 days since it was constructed. In the last several days, I reported that the Pentagon has decided to abandon the pier, recognizing that it is not actually operational. It's also important to note, however, that when the pier was developed, there was no aid flowing to the northern parts of the Gaza Strip, and since then, several different land crossings have permitted aid to enter into the northern parts of the Gaza Strip directly.
In addition to this, on July 12th, Palestinian sources reported that at least four international aid workers were killed in an Israeli airstrike in the Al Mwasi refugee camp, the humanitarian zone in the southern parts of the Gaza Strip. The attack is reported to have taken place in an aid warehouse in the area. There was no further comment made by the IDF nor by Palestinian sources about this attack. Moving on to the West Bank, on July 11th, a settler attack was reported in the Bazaria village against Palestinians. The IDF later confirmed this, stating that settlers threw stones and torched cars and structures in the area near Nablus, burning down a Palestinian store and setting fire to two tractors and farm equipment. There was, according to reports, the Israeli settlers were later dispersed by the IDF and no arrests were reported. In addition to this, the Israeli Haaretz news site also reported about a second Israeli settler attack that took place on July 11th near the Jania village, quoting senior security officials confirming that Palestinian farmland was torched by settlers. Other news related to the West Bank, substantial IDF activity was reported in the last several days in the areas of Abawin, this is the area north of Ramallah. Violent confrontations reportedly broke out as the IDF moved in in order to carry out arrests. One Palestinian was reportedly killed in these gun battles. Some political news related to the West Bank. The International Court of Justice, the ICJ, announced on July 12th that it will deliver its advisory opinion with regards to the Israeli occupation in the West Bank next week on Friday, July 19th. This procedure is separate from the ICJ case that has been prominent in the news, South Africa's case charging Israel with genocide. This case uh, it relates to a request that was made back in 2022 by the United Nations following a petition by the Palestinian Authority to request that the court give its opinions with regards to, among others, and I quote, the Israeli actions to change the demographic composition, nature, and status of Jerusalem, and the adoption of discriminatory legal practices and procedures in the, in the West Bank, giving its opinion on how these reflect on the occupation. The main claim being put forth in the court case is that the occupation is not a temporary measure of disputed lands, as Israel claims, but rather that Israel has made it the permanent apartheid-style regime in the West Bank. The court's position, however, it's important to note, is going to be advisory. The court has been asked to give its opinion. This is not an actual ruling on what should happen. And while it may be damning for Israel, it is not going to be binding. It is likely going to be something else that will be used against Israel in different international forums. However, unlike the case of where Israel is charged with genocide by South Africa, this is not going to lead to any binding ruling for the country. Moving on to the northern parts of Israel, southern parts of Lebanon, there were there were substantial escalations between the sides, as has been for the last several weeks, also in the last several days. The largest barrage of attack took place in the last days on July 11th. El Miyadin reported about a combined Hezbollah attack that included rocket fire aimed at distracting Israel's air defenses that was followed by multiple drone attacks. Rockets and drone alerts were sounded throughout the entire Upper Galilee and Western Galilee throughout July 11th. Several drones were reportedly intercepted, while others did manage to penetrate Israeli airspace in the Galilee, some crashing near Kabri in Naharia, and others in the Western Galilee. These are some of the pictures that emerged from the different sites where these drones did manage to attack. One IDF soldier was reportedly killed in these attacks in the Western Galilee, and there were also attacks reported in the areas of Zarit and Shomra. On July 12th, there were continuous rockets and mortars that were fired towards areas of Margaliot and Metula, with those electrical failure as a result of a missile hitting. Rockets were also fired towards areas of Misgav Am, Adamit, and Shtula. On July 13th, there were barrages of rockets and missiles that were fired by Hezbollah towards areas of Kiryat Shmona, Tel Chai, Kfar Baruch, Kfar Yuval, Mayan Baruch, Zarit, and the list goes on. Hezbollah also claimed firing both Falk missiles as well as Jihad missiles in several of these events, as well as 10 Katyusha missiles towards Kiryat Shmona. Four IDF soldiers were reportedly injured in those attacks on Kiryat Shmona. Regarding IDF activity, on July 11th, Hezbollah structures were reportedly targeted by the IDF in the areas of Ataiba, and al Miyadin also reported substantial artillery fire near the areas of Beit Leif. Other airstrikes also targeted Hezbollah targets throughout the areas of Yarin, Ramia, El Jibin, and Tirkherfa. These are some of the pictures that emerged from Tirkherfa, showing the devastation after those attacks. The IDF also reported targeting a truck carrying a rocket launcher in the Ita Asha'ab area on July 11th. On July 12th, it was reported that there was a drone attack that the IDF carried out in the El Mari region, targeting a figure on a motorbike. Saudi al Hadith later reported that a prominent figure in Hezbollah was badly injured, however no reports were made regarding who was that figure.
In addition to this, on July 12th, the IDF reported that carrying out airstrikes targeting Hezbollah infrastructure, lookout posts, and military structures in the areas of Ramia, El Jibin, Tilkherfa, and Kila village. Attacks were also reported in the areas of Rashia El Fawar, other airstrikes in El Khayyam, and again, the list goes on. On July 13th, El Mian reported an unusual IDF attack that took place when a drone fired at a target near the Litani River, reportedly killing two people, although again, their identity was not given. The IDF reported about other airstrikes in the Hula area, ta- uh, targeting launching sites, and against Hezbollah structures in the areas of Ita Sha'ab. In addition to this, on July 13th, El Mian reported that an, a vehicle was attacked with, by an IDF drone near the Tavnit village. Shortly after that, the Saudi Arabia news network reported that Abbas Qasem, who is a regional commander for Hezbollah, was assassinated in that attack. In addition to that, other news related to the northern parts of Israel, but this time with the Syrian front. On July 11th, rockets were fired from Syria, targeting the Golan Heights in Israel, causing fires to break out. Hours later, reports came out then in Syria that the IDF had retaliated with artillery fire, targeting the areas of Tassil and Adwan in the areas west of Dara. The IDF later confirmed these reports. In addition to that, on July 13th, two drones were fired from Syria, making their way towards Eilat in the southern parts of Israel, and they were intercepted before they penetrated Israeli airspace. Hours later, the IDF reported attacking Syrian military command center and other military infrastructure in the area. The IDF also put out a statement saying that anything that is launched from Syria will meet with a retaliation against the Syrian army. Moving on to some of the political developments from the last several days. Speaking at the NATO conference in Washington, D.C., Turkish President Erdogan stated that Turkey will not accept NATO cooperation with Israel anymore, adding that Israel cannot maintain its partnership with NATO at this time. It's important to note that while Israel is not a NATO member, it is defined as a major non-NATO ally since the late 1980s. Other political news, the United States announced a series of new sanctions that will be imposed on Israeli individuals in the last several days. These include Reut Ben Chaim, the first woman on the sanction list, who is one of the leaders of the Tzav 9 organization. This is an organization that, that in Israel is trying to disrupt the entrance of aid into the Gaza Strip. In addition to that, sanctions were also announced against two settlers from the West Bank, and more broadly against the Lahava movement. This is an Israeli movement that is dedicated to Jewish racial purity, and has been known to attack Arabs and Palestinian men who are suspected of having relations with Jewish women. In other political news, on July 13th, there was unusual rhetoric and mutual condemnations between Hamas and the Palestinian Authority. Following the assassination attempt of Mohammed Def, which again took place in the Al-Muasi humanitarian zone, Munir Garoub, who is a prominent figure in Fatah, condemned Hamas for the attack, stating, and I quote, If Hamas wanted to fight Israel face to face, it would do do so where the army is, rather than where civilians are. Hamas hides among the people in order to protect itself, using Palestinians as human shields. Hamas in turn demanded that the Palestinian Authority retract and condemn these statements. However, instead, the Palestinian Authority Chairman Mahmoud Abbas's office issued an even more accusatory statement, stating, and I quote, We see Hamas as bearing legal, moral, and political responsibility for Israel's continued war of destruction against our people, adding an implication that Hamas is avoiding coming to a hostage deal on a ceasefire due to internal political reasons. The statement also continued to say, and I quote, We call upon Hamas, the Hamas movement, to prioritize national interests and remove the occupation's excuse in order to stop this public massacre of our people. So again, while both sides have issued a lot of statements saying that they're trying to reconcile. This is the most inflammatory rhetoric between the sides, arguably, since the war began. Moving on to the future of the Gaza Strip, speaking at a press conference on July 11th, U.S. President Biden stated that the war has to end. However, he emphasized that ending the war does not mean stopping the hunt for Yahya Sinwar. I will say here that if you'd like to hear more analysis about that specific press conference and Biden's statement, check out the latest news interview that I uploaded on my channel earlier today, where I discussed these statements at length. Biden added, and I quote, Six weeks ago, I presented a plan that was endorsed by the UN Security Council, and there is both Israeli and Hamas agreement to the framework. He then added that there are still disagreements, but the teams are working to resolve them, and concluded by stating, The day after in the Gaza Strip must be without an Israeli occupation. 
And related to this, on July 11th, the Washington Post published a report about a significant advancement that was made in the negotiations that were going on in Qatar, stating that Israel and Hamas have agreed to the establishment of an interim government in the Gaza Strip that will take place during the second phase of the hostage deal that will not include Israel nor Hamas. According to the report, the interim government governing body will be made up from a trained U.S. force alongside forces from quote-unquote moderate Arab countries, as well as a core group of 2,500 Gazan Palestinians who have previous affiliation with the Palestinian Authority. It's important to note that this report has not been confirmed elsewhere and was also immediately denied by both Israel and Hamas, and even though the Post did a- added that despite these, this advancement, it is still far from being a done deal, the mere fact that the Post is reporting about this may indicate that these negotiations are taking place, whether there's agreement or disagreement, we'll learn later, but that unto itself is quite an important advancement. If you find these reports informative, please do remember to hit that like button, subscribe, turn on notifications. I also ask that you send them to anyone who you might think is interested, anyone who is trying to follow the war or any groups or places of worship that you might be a part of, anyone who is interested, please help me distribute them. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them in the comment section below. That is my, those are my highlights from the last several days. Thanks for watching.